The Chantry teaches us that it is the hubris of men which brought the Darkspawn into our world. The mages had sought to usurp heaven, but instead, they destroyed it. They were cast out, twisted and cursed by their own corruption. They returned as monsters, the first of the Darkspawn. They became a blight upon the lands, unstoppable and relentless. The Dwarven Kingdoms were the first to fall, and from the deep roads, the Darkspawn drove at us again and again, until finally we neared annihilation. Until the Grey Wardens came. Men and women from every race, warriors and mages, barbarians and kings, the Grey Wardens sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness, and prevailed. Welcome once again, my dear students, to another lesson of Dragon Age, the History and Lore of Thedas, with me, Professor Absalom. The topics of today's lesson will range from the darkest and most foul events and monsters that exist in Thedas, to the most heroic and glorious warriors that this world has ever seen. Today, we will learn of the horrible blights, the horrendous darkspawn, and the organization that bravely fights against these abominable incursions, the Grey Wardens. Now, let's start the lesson. There is a lot of information and concepts to unpack in this lesson, and to try and give the topics some kind of starting point, we might as well start with the events of the Blights themselves. I've mentioned the emergence of the Darkspawn from the Deep Roads and the Old Gods in dragon form slumbering beneath the Earth in previous lectures. And during this lesson, we will cover and hopefully clear up some of the theories regarding the origins of these monstrous beings and events, but for now, I will give you a brief overview of what a Blight is, its usual pattern, and the role of the Archdemon in a Blight. The Blight is a cataclysmic event that has befallen the continent of Thedas several times. The reasons as to why and how it happens are in many ways unknown, and what we do know comes from the grim experiences of the previous Blights. One thing is certain, however, and that is that the starting point of a Blight is always marked by the finding, awakening, and corruption of an old god into an Archdemon. Deep beneath the earth slumbers the old gods. These massive high dragons are said to be the old gods worshipped by the ancient Tevinter Imperium, and it is also said that they were banished to the underground by the Maker when they defied his will in the Fade. When an old god is found in the subterranean depths by the wandering darkspawn that infests the underground deep roads, it is awakened from its slumber by the darkspawn and infected with their taint. Thus, the dragon is transformed into the sovereign ruler of the Darkspawn Horde, an archdemon, and will then lead the horde up towards the surface to wreak havoc on the world above. It is not surprising that the surface living peoples of Thedas believed that the end of days had come when the Darkspawn first arrived in the First Blight during the last centuries of the Ancient Era, and subsequent blights after that have shown the apocalyptic effects of the Darkspawn and the Archdemon ascending from the underground. Crops and fields wither and die as the Horde advances, making entire swaths of land unable to produce food for years to come. Land and earth cracks and is blackened as the water and moisture is sucked out of the ground. The taint of the Darkspawn infest not only the earth, but other creatures as well. Disease spread through the realm, animals, plants and people mutate into horrific abominations. Children, pets and livestock, born in the wake of the Horde, 
are often frail, small, and prone to sickness. All of this while unnatural dark clouds blacken the sky to blot out the sunlight, moonlight, and starlight to make the light-sensitive horde more effective on the surface. This roiling dark storm is an omen of dread that can be seen in the sky from kilometers away and it follows the Archdemon and its horde as it advances through Thedas, bringing death and destruction. With the exception of a quite recent historical example, the past blights lasted for a great number of years and brought the peoples and kingdoms of Thedas to their knees, as civilization came close to collapse before they were finally stopped. The draconic leader of a blight, the Archdemon, is a monster beyond the imagination of most beings. Its visage and form twisted into a mockery of a once proud beast. What makes the Archdemon so important and dangerous is not its terrible appearance or power, however, but its intelligence. Most Darkspawn are very disorganized and fractured, only able to perform small raids or invasions while under the command of other more powerful or influential Darkspawn. They are a hive mind that very easily splinters and are prone to infighting. An Archdemon, however, is intelligent enough to plan ahead, calculate strategies and tactics, and most important of all, has the ability to communicate and lead the Darkspawn Horde. Every Darkspawn can hear and are drawn to the call of the Archdemon over vast distances. Its communication sometimes described by Afflicted as a kind of song or a distorted form of speech. With this unconscious link, the Archdemon can relay and communicate orders to the Horde on what it is supposed to do. It has the power to control the hive mind and command the darkspawn to their fullest and most devastating potential. The darkspawn themselves are horrible and distorted versions of one of the main races that inhabit Thedas. Twisted versions of humans, elves, dwarves, and kunari, the darkspawn roam the underground tunnels of the deep roads, only emerging to the surface during minor raids or during blights. Their numbers only seem to grow more numerous the further down into the depths one travels. Although having managed to almost wipe out the dwarven race from the face of Thedas, without the guidance and leadership of an archdemon, the darkspawn hordes are extremely disorganized and prone to infighting. Their only goal seem to be the death destruction, and devastation of all other life on Thedas. There are various theories and speculations as to what the origins of the Darkspawn is, and how they came into being. The most widely believed and propagated of these beliefs comes from the Chantry and the Chant of Light. In minus 395 Ancient, the Tevinter Magisters in charge of the faith of the Old Gods performed a ritual that physically allowed them to enter the Fade, something that was unprecedented. According to Chantry Canon, the Magisters had been tempted by the Old Gods with promises of godhood if they entered the Fade and set foot inside the Golden City, the seat of the Maker himself. But when they did, the Golden City was blackened and turned into the Black City, bringing the Maker's wrath upon them, as it is described in the Chant of Light itself, Phronondes 8, verse 13, quote, And so is the Golden City blackened, with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven, and doom upon all the world. The Magisters were cast out of the Fade by the Maker, their forms corrupted and blackened. They became the first Darkspawn, and their transgression became known as the Second Sin. From the tainted Magisters, their taint was in turn spread to other creatures, 
and thus the Darkspawn race was born. At least according to the Chantry. This is, as mentioned, the most widely accepted and believed origin story of how the Darkspawn came to be. But there are other angles to this legend. Understandably, the Tevinter version of this story is a bit different to the official Orlesian Chantry version. Tevinter Magisters deny their predecessor's involvement in the origins of the Darkspawn, and claim that the Darkspawn has always existed deep underground, with no connection to the ancient Magister Sidereal. This version of events have, in light of recent historical events and findings, become quite an untenable one. But more on that later. The Dwarves, the civilization with arguably the most experience in combating and surviving the predations of the Darkspawn underground, disregards much of the speculations and versions that the surface dwellers have in regards to the origins of the Darkspawn. The Chantry version of events are considered by many to be nonsense, since the Dwarves matter-of-factly states that the Darkspawn did not fall from heaven, they emerged from the depths of the earth, and that is where their origins lies. Some scholars of the Dwarven Shaperet even speculate, since it is known that the Darkspawn are birthed from hideous females known as Broodmothers, that the origin of the foul monsters might lie in an original giant Broodmother deep beneath the earth. Perhaps at the very heart of our world sits a queen, the First Mother, the Dwarven Shaper Volta speculates in one of her books. Speaking of Broodmothers, let us move on to the not-so-pleasant topic of Darkspawn birth and the different species of Darkspawn that exists. Pale, dark, and twisted creatures. The different species of Darkspawn are born to a hideous creature known as a Broodmother. A Broodmother is a female Darkspawn created through corruption and taint, and are able to birth more Darkspawn. Broodmothers start off as ghouls, a category of tainted creatures that I will get back to later, but for the moment, let's focus on the Darkspawn themselves. Stationary during most of their lives. The Broodmother's main purpose is to birth more Darkspawn, and will during their lives birth thousands of Darkspawn from her womb. Emerging from birth as children already able to walk for the most part, they are worm-like grubs that quickly evolve into fully grown Darkspawn. Depending on the previous race of the Broodmother, she will birth different types of Darkspawn. Dwarven Broodmothers give birth to Genlocks, Elven ones to Shrieks, Humans to Hurlocks, and Kossith slash Kunari to Ogres. These are the main four species of the Darkspawn. A Broodmother will give birth to a large litter of Darkspawn all at once, each time between 20 and 50 Darkspawn. Young Darkspawn, as mentioned earlier, evolve quickly during the first weeks of their life, and even this early in their lives, their existence is filled with violence. Whether out of pleasure or instinct, young Darkspawn compete against each other for survival, and many young ones will try to kill each other and thus root out the weak offsprings of the brood. In some cases, a young darkspawn emerges that is so strong or clever that it manages to wipe out the rest of the brood that it was born with. These darkspawn are known as alphas, and will seek to dominate other weaker darkspawn as it gets older, often receiving positions of command in the event of a blight. Physiologically, Darkspawn varies depending on species, but they all have a number of shared biological features. Pale and monstrous twisted versions of their former races, dark blood blackened by the taint flows through their bodies, and the black taint is also visible in their eyes and mouths. The taint within the Darkspawn's bodies allows for quick healing from injuries and wounds. In some cases, 
cut off limbs and digits might even manage to grow back. The taint also sustains the Darkspawn's bodies, making it unnecessary for Darkspawn to eat or drink. They are still able to eat and drink, however, but they are not required to do so for dietary purposes. Darkspawn are, however, known to consume and devour prisoners, captives, and other enemies that get in their way, often only for the sole purpose of inflicting pain and torture on their victims. Although able to act both underground and on the surface, Darkspawn have better dark vision than light vision, and sunlight weakens them considerably. Even during blights, when much of the sky is obstructed by dark clouds blocking out sunlight, Darkspawn are known to be less ferocious and energized than they are in the darkness below ground. Some Darkspawn are even able to use magic, and are thus known as emissaries. Using blight magic, a strange version of blood magic, these tainted mages seldom surfaces unless a blight calls them into action against the rest of Thedas. All Darkspawn can hear the song of the Archdemon, and follows its call. This is also how Darkspawn manages to find new old gods to corrupt underground, by following the song of the ancient creature. The different species of Darkspawn are, as mentioned before, a reflection of the previous race of the Broodmother in question, and the different species receive traits reflective of the previous race in question. Herlocks, for example, are traced back to humans, and are larger and more muscular than other Darkspawn, while Genlocks are similar to Dwarves in that they are shorter, tougher, and more resilient to damage, especially magic. An interesting thing to note is that Genlocks are able to cast magic, despite them being created from Dwarves. Sharlocks, also known as Shrieks for their hideous screams, have inherited the dexterous and nimble nature of the elves, excelling at agile feats of stealth and assassination. And ogres, bred from the Kossith Broodmothers, are enormous shock troopers of raw power and brute force. Creatures that are infected with the Darkspawn taint often suffer very painful deaths, either very fast or by slowly wasting away. Those who manage to survive are pale reflections of their former selves, with sickly and blotchy skin. As the body deteriorates further, cannibalistic urges and insanity plagues the ghoul, as it too, like the Darkspawn, starts hearing the song of the Archdemon in their minds. This horrendous sickness will eventually lead to the ghoul's death. Animals can also turn into ghouls, though their transformation results in the animal becoming larger and exceedingly more violent against anything around it. Many animals mutate into monstrous versions of their former selves, like blight wolves who are mutated lupines, corrupted spiders who are tainted arachnids, bereskarns who are mutated bears, and even dragon thralls who are draconic ghouls. In the event of a blight, Darkspawn of the Alpha variant serve as generals and commanders in the Horde army. This is because Alphas are often taller, more muscular, better equipped, but are also more intelligent and willing to lead than other Darkspawn. The Horde is also held together by the Emissaries, the mages of the Darkspawn who make sure that both the normal Darkspawn of the Horde, but also the Alpha Generals, follow the orders and commands of the Archdemon, instead of following their own whims. In the absence of a Blight, this command structure largely falters, with no Archdemon to control the hive mind of the Darkspawn. Many Alphas can take control of smaller bands of Darkspawn. They rule through fear and intimidation, rather than the supreme control and tactical acumen of the Archdemon, leading to subsequent raids led by these Alphas being mostly disorganized 
and haphazard. As mentioned, most Darkspawn lack the intelligence of other races and cannot communicate beyond simple grunts and snarls. But beyond the rank and file, and also apart from even the more intelligent alphas and emissaries, there exist rare examples of extremely intelligent Darkspawn, equal in mind to any elf or human. More about the special Darkspawn later in the lesson. It seems that the only purpose and interaction with the outside world that the Darkspawn have is death, destruction, and devastation. And for the longest time, it seemed like none could stand against them. Until the Grey Wardens were formed. The Order of the Grey Wardens is a military organization with the sole purpose of combating Darkspawn and defeating future blights that threaten all of Thedas. Founded during the apocalyptic days of the First Blight at the Weishaupt Fortress in the country of the Anderfels, where the Order's headquarters still exist, the Grey Wardens were instrumental in turning the tide against the Darkspawn by finally ending more than a century of conflict by doing the impossible, slaying the Archdemon and driving the Darkspawn back underground. Since then, the Grey Wardens stand as the primary and sometimes sole defenders of the entire continent of Thedas against the Darkspawn menace. Men and women from every corner of the continent, be they rich or poor, peasant or noble, mage or non-mage, the Order accepts all recruits if they are deemed to be worthy recruits and can survive the hardships that becoming a Grey Warden encompasses. A Warden leaves their previous lives and the loyalties they had in regards to country, creed, and titles to focus entirely on fighting the Darkspawn. The mightiest warriors and the sharpest intellects is sought after when recruiting new members, and for some, it is indeed a great honor to join this most esteemed of orders, despite the dangers. The act of recruiting new members is a mighty one, a president set down after the end of the first blight, to ensure a steady supply of manpower to the organization and ensure its survival. These old laws and mandates for recruiting is something known as the right of conscription. In simple terms, the right of conscription means that whether the conscript wants it or not, the wardens can recruit anyone. Is the person a prisoner sentenced to death for murder? Too bad. Are they a ruler of a nation? So be it. For many, the Grey Wardens are a way to let go of their previous lives, or to turn a new leaf. As mentioned, many consider it a great honor to join the Order and fight for the good of the continent. The Rite of Conscription also allows the Grey Wardens to recruit mages from the Circle of Magi, one mage per circle, often chosen at a young age. The Order also accepts volunteers into their ranks, with city elves being a popular demographic for volunteers. Understandably so, considering how many city elves are mistreated and regarded as second-class citizens in much of Thedas. They might see the Order as a chance for true freedom, equality, and fair treatment. For it is true that the Grey Wardens do not care about your race or background, only your willingness to fight the Darkspawn and defend the continent. In the Order, they are brothers and sisters, true equals, one and all. In order for a recruit to become a fully-fledged Grey Warden, they must first undergo a, to outsiders, secret and dangerous ritual, known as the Joining. The ritual can trace its origins back to the founding of the Order during the First Blight, and speaks of the bravery and willpower of the Warden's progenitors and successors, 
but also of the desperate acts these first wardens were willing to go through to end the blight. It starts with the recruits being sent out under the watchful eye of an older warden to hunt down and kill some darkspawn. This is to find out if they have the strength and courage to actually fight Darkspawn, but it also gathers an important ingredient for the joining, namely Darkspawn blood. When the tainted Darkspawn blood has been collected, the Warden residing over the ritual adds a single drop of one of the rarest substances on the continent to the mix, namely Archdemon blood and uses the magic to make the concoction even slightly ingestible. Yes, you heard me correctly. The recruits have to then consume and drink this mix of blood. Now, under normal circumstances, drinking darkspawn blood would result in severe illness and most often horrible pains followed by death. And the addition of the Archdemon blood only makes this experience even worse. Many recruits who partake in this grim ritual dies as a result of it. But the few who survive it are deemed worthy of becoming a part of the Order and are elevated to the rank of Warden. From that moment onward, the new Warden will share a rare and deep connection with the Darkspawn for the rest of their days being able to sense their presence and closeness. And during the event of a blight, a warden is able to hear the call of the archdemon, just like any other tainted creature. These abilities makes the Grey Wardens gain an upper hand when combating the Darkspawn, but it also binds the wardens to the terrible fate that awaits anyone who bears the taint within themselves. Due to its frightening nature, the specifics regarding the ritual of the joining is kept a closely guarded secret by the Grey Wardens from the rest of the world. The Order of the Grey Wardens was founded at Weishaupt Fortress, a stronghold in the country of the Anderfelds in northern Thedas. Since it was built by the Order during the First Blight more than 1200 years ago, it has been the headquarters for the military order. Although centuries have whittled away at the old fortress, its glory days may be gone, but not forgotten, as the place still holds exceptional importance for the organization, and is the seat of the Order's most powerful members and leaders. There also exist local Warden headquarters in the different nations of Thedas. For example, the seat of the organization in Orlais is in Montsimard, and in Ferelden, it is the newly established base of Vigil's Keep, an ancient fortress in the northeast, close to the city of Amaranthine. There are many outposts, fortresses and castles under the command of the Wardens, but even more outposts and places lie abandoned and empty. Great and mighty fortresses and castles like Adamant Fortress and Griffin Wing Keep in Western Orlais were built to counter great darkspawn incursions and blights and once housed garrisons of hundreds or thousands, but have today been abandoned because of the reduced numbers of the Order. The Wardens are not as many as they used to be, and their members are spread thin across the continent, making it impossible to garrison many of the old strongholds. Places like Soldier's Peak in Ferelden, or the ruins of the old Warden archives deep in the Korkari Wilds, are testaments to this fact. One of the most recognizable symbols of the Grey Wardens is without a doubt the Griffins. Half lion, half eagle, these majestic flying creatures were tamed during the early years of the Order's founding and used as mounts by its warriors and messengers for the next 700 years or so. It was long thought that this species had gone extinct during the Exalted Age, but even so, Hundreds of years after their disappearance, the Grey Wardens still honor these noble creatures in their heraldry and their arms and armor. The legends of the Grey Wardens flying into battle atop their noble steeds is a perception among the collective consciousness of the common folk that persists even in modern Thedas. 
We have, however, in recent years found out that not all griffins went extinct. A hitherto unknown batch of 13 griffin eggs were found and retrieved by a group of warden recruits in the year 942 Dragon, and the small, healthy hatchlings that were birthed from that nest signaled a new beginning for the species in Thedas. Since the Grey Wardens are a military organization first and foremost, there exists a clear chain of command within the Order, and each rank has its place in the hierarchy. We have mentioned the rank of Warden Recruit earlier, and it is the lowest rank in this hierarchy. Having already sworn off their previous lives and allegiances, Warden Recruits are those who have yet to undertake the joining, but have nevertheless been accepted and been given a rank by the Order, but they are not fully fledged Wardens yet. Those Warden Recruits, who do not survive the joining, are honoured by the Order by having their names written down and stored in their archives. Those men and women of any race who survive the joining are given the rank of Warden, or Warden Ensign if one wants to be technical, and are now truly members of the Order, acting as the military rank and file troops. Mages who survive the joining and become members are known as Warden Acolytes, or simply Acolytes. Above the rank and file is the formal title of Senior Wardens. These Wardens are veteran warriors who have distinguished themselves on the battlefield or through actions which have been deemed worthy of reward. Known as Warden Lieutenants in countries like Orlay and other places, these Wardens can be put in charge of smaller groups or strike forces of Wardens, or can conduct special operations and missions of greater import on their own. A senior warden can also act as second to their direct superior officers, warden constables, if they are the commanding officer at the moment. Warden constables, formerly known as constables of the Grey, are field commanders of the military forces of the wardens, and act as second in command to, in turn, their direct superiors, the Warden Commanders, taking charge and acting on behalf of the Warden Commander in his or her absence. Now, the Warden Commander, or Commander of the Grey, are the leaders of the regional branches of the Order in Thedas. Normally, there is one Warden Commander in control of all Wardens specific for each of the major nations. These commanders are in charge of recruiting new wardens from the regional area, as well as maintaining good relations with the ruling political powers of each region. Over the years, effective lines of communication between the different regional headquarters and the Order headquarters at Weishaupt have deteriorated, and this has led to a great deal of autonomy in regards to the regional warden commanders, who all essentially rule their respective branch how they see fit. When and if a blight breaks out, a rank equal in power and responsibility to that of Warden Commander, known as Field Commander, will be instituted until the blight has been defeated, though it is not clear whether or not a sitting Warden Commander becomes a Field Commander and then reverts back to the original rank, or if another Warden acts as Field Commander in this time instead of the Warden Commander. In any case, Warden Commanders are obliged to send yearly reports to Weishaupt about their progress in each region and the potential activities of Darkspawn in their area of command. These annual reports are sent to their superior officer, the Chamberlain of the Grey. Technically outranking each Warden Commander in the military hierarchy, but more knowledgeable in scholarly and logistical areas than on the field of battle, is the Chamberlain of the Grey. This individual is the senior archivist and keeper of the records at Weishaupt Fortress, but are also, as mentioned, responsible for the yearly reports sent to the fortress by each Warden Commander. There are also specific Warden Archivists from each region that all answer to the Chamberlain of the Grey. Second highest rank in the chain of command is the High Constable, second in command to the leader of the Grey Wardens, and in previous centuries, when the Griffins were still numerous, the aerial commander of the Order. During recent times, 
the rank of High Constable had become somewhat of the public face of the Warden leadership at Weishaupt. In charge of recruitment from the Anderfels and fulfilling the role of diplomat and ambassador to the High King of the Anderfels. The highest rank within the Order, the leader of the entire Grey Warden organization, is the First Warden. Leading from Weishaupt Fortress, the First Warden controls the rest of the Wardens through his second in command, and if he or she wishes to, can summon any or all of the regional Warden commanders to Weishaupt if he or she deems it necessary. Famed for the military command and powers of the rank, the First Warden does not hold the same military power in Thedas today due to the deteriorating communication lines following the extinction of the Griffins. Acting military power is today mainly held by each regional Warden commander, and the role of the First Warden is today one that is mainly political and symbolic in nature. The Grey Wardens are vigilant in times of peace for any minor darkspawn incursion and raids, and mobilizes its full military might in times of blights. Due to the existential threat that the Blight poses to the entire continent, and the precedent set by this fact, the Wardens uphold a series of treaties with the human nations of Thedas, but also other powerful factions like the Dwarves of Orsamar, the Dalish Elves, and the Circle of Magi. These factions are obliged to assist the Wardens in this struggle for the survival of Thedas. As far as other existential threats to the continent goes, a silver-tongued warden with a knack for diplomacy could use the treaties to rally support against other forces and threats, but the power that the treaties hold are most often used for its intended purpose in times of blight. Even though the wardens become immune to the taint through the joining and gain huge advantages in fighting the darkspawn as a result, the taint never stops corrupting the Warden's body, and even if it is slow and takes time, the taint will corrupt the Warden's body bit by bit until the Warden is consumed with its corruption. From the moment the Warden survives the joining until the last breath of life, the taint will spread like a disease in the body, causing physical pain, a deteriorating mental state, and lastly, madness once a warden becomes old. This is known as the calling, and usually starts occurring around 35 years after the warden partakes in the joining, though some cases occur earlier than so. The older you get as a warden, the more vulnerable you become to the rotting corruption of the taint. Before the warden gets corrupted, beyond the point of no return, he takes farewell of his comrades, friends and loved ones and travels underground to the realm of the Dwarves. There, the Warden honours an old pact between the Grey Wardens and the Dwarves, made in ages past, as he serves a year beside them by fighting Darkspawn in the Deep Roads. And when the pain of the calling becomes too much to bear for the Warden, he or she sets off alone into the Deep Roads, with the sole purpose of finding and killing as many darkspawn as possible, taking as many of the monsters as they can with them before the warden inevitably gets killed. Even those wardens who try to avoid this grisly fate will sooner or later find themselves in the deep roads or in the path of the darkspawn. For the calling binds all creatures of the taint together. This noble death and sacrifice is said to be one of the greatest acts a warden performs in their lives, giving their lives and destroying as many enemies as they can for the greater good of all Thedas. Another sacrifice that the wardens must always make is something that must occur every time a blight breaks out, in order for the world to not be overrun by the evil forces of the darkspawn. Every blight is led by an archdemon, and those corrupted high dragons are exceptionally powerful and very hard to slay. Even if one were to slay the mighty beast in battle, the spirit of the old god simply leaves the slain body 
and possesses the nearest tainted creature, normally a darkspawn of the Horde. Since the darkspawn are thought to be soulless, the spirit of the old god simply plants itself in this new body and transforms it into a new high dragon. In this way, many hopes have been splintered in previous blights, with the archdemon seemingly beat only to appear again from the body of another darkspawn ready to lead once more. This is why the archdemon cannot be killed by anyone. The only people who are capable of killing the creature is one of the Grey Wardens. And as such, its bane must be delivered by one of the Order. The reason why only Wardens are capable of slaying Archdemons has to do with them being tainted creatures, yet still possessing a soul. If a Warden manages to bring an end to an Archdemon, the spirit of the Old God tries to possess the Warden's body, since it is the closest tainted creature. But because the Warden is a creature with a soul, the possession of the new body fails, with both the soul of the Archdemon and the souls of the Warden being destroyed. Ever since the end of the First Blight, this grim fact looms over every facet of the Grey Warden Order, because if push comes to shove, any one of them might have to give their own life to save Thedas from total annihilation. Wary against the Darkspawn enemy in peacetime, and fearsome against them in wartime, the Wardens carry a tremendous weight on their collective shoulders as the protectors of Thedas against the tainted menace that lurks below. The sacrifices that they have to make, giving up their previous lives to become a part of the Order, but also the bodily sacrifices they have to make, with the joining, the calling, and all that entails of being a Warden throughout their lives is existence, fraught with pain and sacrifice. It is said, that the Maker smiles sadly on his Grey Wardens, as no sacrifice is greater than theirs. In the end, one of them might have to make the ultimate sacrifice to stave off the Blight, and all of the Wardens will eventually, no matter where their lives might take them, end up fighting to the death in the Deep Roads against hordes of Darkspawn monsters. The motto of the Order of the Grey Wardens is aptly chosen, for it represents and encapsulates all that the Wardens stand for and strive to achieve. In war, victory. In peace, vigilance. In death, sacrifice. Five blights have ravaged the continent of Thedas throughout its history. The most recent and shortest one the Fifth Blight broke out in the year 930 Dragon, and ended only a year later in Ferelden, much due to the heroic actions of a certain Hero of Ferelden, and the companions of this hero and the allies who fought alongside that hero at that time. The tales of these previous Blights will have to be the subject of future lessons, since the subject matter is simply too vast to be covered in this one lecture but it is something we will get to in due time, for it is of great importance to the history of Thedas as a whole. Many a scholar have speculated and theorized as to how vast the Darkspawn hordes are beneath the surface of Thedas, how long the dwarves can survive against this constant threat, and how many blights will come in the future until we might finally be rid of them for good. As far as future blights are concerned, one can only speculate of their nature. If previous events is anything to go by, there is only two remaining old gods hidden beneath the surface of the continent. After those two have been turned into archdemons, and after the world will hopefully endure another two blights and survive, we will see the end of the blights as a phenomenon since there will be no more archdemons to lead the Darkspawn. If this will be true, only the future will tell. There have been other Darkspawn-related events besides the Blights during recent years in Thedas that might have further ramifications in the future, 
One of these revolve around the so-called Amaranthine Conflict in 931 Dragon, and a Darkspawn, simply known as the Architect. This highly intelligent Darkspawn, a rarity in and of itself, had managed to ignore the call of the Old God, and through a twisted Darkspawn version of the Joining, perpetrated by feeding Warden blood to other Darkspawn, were able to break free of the collective hive mind of the Old Gods. These Darkspawn, who followed the Architect, and the Architect himself, were sentient creatures, fully capable of speech, and faculties enough to ponder the purpose of their own twisted existence. It was the Architect's hope that if all Darkspawn could be given Warden blood, the race could become free from their bonds. The Architect and his disciples require basically an entire lesson dedicated to them, but the fact that they are such a deviance from normal Darkspawn speaks of groundbreaking implications in regards to these creatures. Another Darkspawn threat that Thedas quite recently had to endure, this too the subject of future lectures, was the ancient and intelligent Darkspawn known as Corypheus. Rumored to be one of the original Tevinter Magisters who physically entered the Fade and the Golden City, this powerful Darkspawn managed to escape its ages-long imprisonment in a Warden-constructed prison, and later unleashed a cataclysmic event upon the continent in which the skies split asunder and the ground sprouted red lyrium. More on Corypheus another time. The Darkspawn are some of the most monstrous creatures that the continent has ever seen, and the blights that they partake in are calamitous events that ruin much of Thedas every time they break out. Their origins are ancient, and the truth of their existence is still very much a mystery. But just as much of a threat that these forces pose, they are countered every time by the valiant men and women of the Grey Wardens, sworn to protect and give their lives so that Thedas can be free from the Darkspawn menace. That's it for this lesson, my dear students. These subject matters have been both quite disturbing but also quite exciting to discuss with you about, so I hope you have enjoyed it. Until we meet again, I have been Professor Absalom, and I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoy the content, be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and check out the other videos on the channel. More interesting lore videos will be coming in the future, so keep an eye out. Thank you once again, and until next time, have a good one.